very delighted to be here and to uh, co-chair uh, this uh, first panel of our wonderful uh, symposium and uh, uh, also very pleased to introduce our first uh, speaker who is uh, Jeremy Gilbert who is professor of cultural and political theory at the University of East London and the current editor of journal New Formations the author of uh, many books, uh, mostly uh, circulating around the questions of politics, sound, and uh, popular culture, but there are very numerous, so I won't uh, cite all of them. Uh, he's also uh, working on three uh, coming books, which is uh, even more exciting. Uh, and uh, titles of those, uh, I would. Uh, quote for you. Uh, these are 21st century socialism, which is coming even this year. Then hegemon, hegemony now, power in the 21st century, uh, 2020, and last but not least, the last days of neoliberalism, politics, culture and society since 2008. He is not only a scholar, but also a, a writer for uh, many uh, journals and magazines. Uh, he writes widely on politics, music and cultural theory. He's also engaged in uh, political uh, activity uh, with the Labour Party uh, where he uh, debated mostly the policy and strategy uh, of, um, of the party. He was a strategic advisor to Jeremy Corbyn in the 2016 campaign for re-election. Uh, he is going to present a paper uh, entitled Potent Collectivities, Aesthetics of Solidarity. Please welcome Jeremy. Uh, of course you can speak here. Uh, hello, thanks very much for, thanks for inviting me to be here. A very interesting event and um, um, okay. not, we don't need to see all that for the moment. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, I always feel um, I have I have to sort of apologise at this stage because I got I you know I sort of realised this morning uh, people have been inviting me to speak at events in this part of the world and sort of German speaking part of the world for uh, 20 odd years now and I just still I don't really speak German and I don't really know um, which is you know it's not my fault I didn't go if, if you only learn German in the school in Britain you go to a kind of very kind of an elite school and I didn't. So, um, so feel sorry for me. And, <laughs> and I really, and I'm, I'm quite conscious that, especially at the moment, um, the work I'm doing and the, all, all the stuff I have to talk about is coming out of a very, really a very combined American context. Because um, we kind of, we are very much in the throes of a, of a, of a particular political crisis like in the UK. Um, and it's quite closely related to a kind of parallel crisis in the US uh, with, within. But um, it's also, and really most of what I have to say about the issues with which we're concerned here does come out of quite specific experience of very intense neoliberalization over the past few decades, which is, um, it's quite different from experiences in certainly northern and central and to some extent the rest of Western Europe. So I can I can only really sort of apologise for that and say, well that is the experience that, it, that I'm speaking to. Um, and I'm aware that it's you know it's a different thing. Although obviously there are kind of global similarities. So I thought I'm um, to start off I'm, I'm just gonna uh, I'm gonna show some images which will speak to a particular theme and then I'll start talking about what the theme what the theme is. And so the first are a few images relating to political developments in actually political events in the UK, in Britain, uh, in the late 1970s, the mid to late 1970s through to I'm sorry to interrupt you because we actually don't see the images. No no I pulled it out that's right. You'll see you'll see them when I'm ready. <laughs> okay. I mean, the pictures—they're not massively important. It's, 
It's not a lot of presentations. But, okay. but we can, if you can't, we can decide when we see them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a, I'm not a lot of person, so I can't claim them. They're not, you know, they're not kind of clever at um, But I think they sort of evoke something, which is, it, it, which is important. Now we've said something about the historical genesis of the moment that we're in now. Hang on, I just, how long do you want this view for? 25 minutes. Sorry? 25 minutes. Okay, from when? When did I start? <laughs> All right. All right. Let's go through this. All right. So, all right. So these are these initial images are related to things from. Um,
Um, and again, um, lesbian and gay support the minors was this small group of a London-based lesbian and gay activists who became involved in supporting the minor strike. Uh, in, um, in 1984, um, they famously raised enough money to buy this van, um, which was used by people in the, in the pit village in South Wales, the mining village in South Wales that they became kind of allied to. That's a poster for a famous <laughs> uh, concert that they organised, um, headlined by Bronski V. And um, that's the poster for the feature film, which was made, which was a sort of surprise hit. As of, you know, um, uh, a few years ago, and the film, the film is definitely worth watching. Although it's, what's interesting is that the film actually sort of plays down, you know, the radicalism of what happened, because uh, the film tries to turn. The, it's all about the kind of emotional drama of the relationships between these, these, you know, these sort of politically advanced, you know, gay people from London and these uh, socially conservative miners from South Wales. And the truth is that actually. For the most part, that mining community in South Wales wasn't really, you know, wasn't very socially conservative, and wasn't, you know, there wasn't a great deal of homophobia because it had already um, been radicalised by uh, the women's liberation movement and its relationships with the trade unions and the centrality of women's liberation politics to the way in which the strike had been organised and the role of women in it. So again, this is, but it's it's remembered, I think, you know, this very striking. It's now it's remembered in this way because. Of the, um, <coughs> because it marks a really striking example of a sort of ideal of solidarity, as a, you know, as you know, outside of any kind of um, identitarian, identitarian category. And then, just a couple of just much more recent images. These are actually images of people, um, uh, people um, gathering to campaign in the general election that's taking place right now uh, in the United Kingdom. And this is all actually in Chingford, which is a suburb of London, which is traditionally extremely conservative, extremely traditionally associated um, with support for the far right and kind of racist policies. I've got a picture of that. Um, it became famous really and notorious because it, it's, its MP was this guy, Michael uh, Norman Tebbit, who was a big ally of Thatcher's, and was known as the Chingford skinhead um, because of his po po politics as much as his lack of hair. And um, so Chingford, and Chingford, I mean, I live near Chingford, and I used to, until very, I mean, I remember taking my children there when they were small to get walking in the woods, and they would say, you have to be careful here, because this is where our enemies live. <laughs> and, um, and now Chingford is, you know, Chingford has become a real site of mobilisation, because the, uh, the Asian, sort of, the Chingford-born kind of British Asian candidate, Faiza Shaheen, looks very likely, it's not certain, but looks very likely to, uh, to win, win, you know, to defeat kind of sitting Conservative MP there, and there's been a huge amount of excitement because of the, the sheer scale of mobilisation. So these pictures have been circulating on social media and elsewhere, showing literally hundreds of people. I think some um, 700 people have been turning up most days of the weekend for the past few weeks to try to sort of flood the constituency with campaigning. And again. What seems to be going on here is a real kind of evocation of a, as, a, as a manifestation of some possibility of collective agency. And why I think this is you know, historically interesting and this is just significant is because I think, um, I don't know why, I can't get it to do the thing where it just, um, uh, I just wanted to let me read my notes and show the images. But I thought this might not work, so I got it on the, uh, I got it on my computer. I've got it, I put the notes on my phone. Um, so I think what's going on here in all these cases is that really what is that what's being evoked is what's being evoked is a um, is a, is a certain kind of ideal of um, a certain kind of ideal of solidarity. And I think this has a certain kind of power, and it has a certain emotional power. Uh, I'm just going to have something to do without the images at the moment. It has a certain kind of emotional power to the extent that these images all evoke something that really the entire apparatus of neoliberalism since the 1970s has been calibrated to render impossible. That the neoliberalism operates, and neoliberal modes of governmentality and modes of the production of culture have really worked to systematically render impossible 
the meaningful experience of relations of solidarity. I think, I mean, my own, I, mean, I would say that, uh, and I, you know, I would say that um, one way to understand, an important way in which to understand uh, the key operative function of neoliberalism since the 1970s has been in its systematic in inhibition of the emergence, the survival, the empowerment of what I call potent collectivities, which is really on any scale, any kind of group, any kind of, um, which is capable of taking meaningful social action. So when I talk about potent collectivities, you, 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 we really, I really mean anything from sort of socially functional neighbourhoods, you know, to, to schools working as kind of social units, to national political movements, to transnational networks. And I think, uh, I think what's one of the things that's important to note here, and which one reason why I think that those um, those images and that history that they evoke are so important, is because this isn't just about class. I think a lot of the literature on neoliberalism and a lot of um, discourse on neoliberalism from a Marxist perspective um, absolutely accurately stresses the extent to which neoliberalism has worked through um, you know, implementing a social program and a political program which has undermined the basis, the basis for class solidarity and basis for any form of um, meaningful political action on the basis of, uh, especially for working class people clearly, on the basis of Class. But I think it's also important to note that even outside the domain of class politics, neoliberalism has worked systematically against any form of collectivity, any form of collective agency. Uh, so, for example, um, all of the kind of the, what were once called the new social movements, the kind of liberation movements of the 60s and 70s, women's liberation, black power, gay liberation, at a certain stage in their history, all proposed a clearly collectivist and democratic rejection of established systems of, and hierarchical systems of power. You know, they were collective movements, they were movements of liberation, of collective liberation. And what has happened, you know, under, what happens under conditions of neoliberal hegemony is that very often it becomes very difficult or impossible for those movements to pursue their objectives in that form. And, there, and what happens is they become overcoded, they become kind of re-channeled, re -tooled into discourses and institutional projects which really organise around enabling individuals to make specific kinds of claims on the state or on employers according to a basically liberal logic um, rather than mobilising collectivities in the pursuit of collective emancipation. Uh, and I think this is really, I mean, this is the, the basic logic of identity politics, and it's sort of properly conceived, or sort of narrowly, specifically conceived. Um, so I think one of the key you know, ways in which neoliberal hegemony has been achieved and secured, in fact, is, is through enabling uh, certain kinds of, um, you know, certain kinds of claims to you know, equality or, or, or to, you know, diver, you know, say diversity, certainly within elite sectors, to be made provided they're made in the name of individuals and individuals' kind of ability to aspire to certain you know, quite narrowly defined forms of social success. But I think, um, and I think, you know, that's not to criticise people who've pursued those kinds of strategies at all, because I think it's always you know, it's clearly been necessary and it has made sense under specific conditions. And I think, in, but I think in this sense, you know, neoliberalism has always been an explicitly anti-democratic project. It's been a project, not it's been a project which has been specifically aimed at rendering impossible uh, the expression of the kind of collective capacities of any form of social group or any form of collectivity. This, and I think this is partly this speaks to what we understand by democracy itself. I mean, democracy that it's a really um, I think it's it's surprising how poorly defined democracy often is as a concept. Actually, and everybody's got a different definition of it, but. I mean, my definition of democracy would be to say that it, it always, democracy always, it's always a process that potentiates, that makes kind of powerful in some ways, to complex collectivities. Collectivities uh, which are able to express them, are able to kind of coordinate their actions and to make decisions in the world in some meaningful way. And uh, neoliberal, neoliberalism is always, to some extent, um, is always kind of militating against that. Now I think this is important to understand because I think this partly explains a good deal of the sort of populist 
backlash, which has occurred, and this sort of nativist backlash that has occurred in many places around the world. But I think one way that we understanding the rise of a certain kind of conservative populism, uh, or which often takes a kind of nationalistic or a nativist cast in different contexts, is to understand it as to some extent an attempt to, um, an attempt by populations who've experienced a kind of real loss of their collective capacities to have any real effect over you know, their environment, their lives, the social institutions with which they engage since the 1970s, and to find some kind of vehicles through which they can do that. And traditionally, you know, nationalist, nationalism offers people, at least on an imaginary level, a way of seeing themselves as part of a larger group and as a potentially potent collectivity, in fact. Um, I think at the same time, and I, um, I think obviously, and I think if that kind of a nativist, you know, a reactionary politics is going to be resisted, if it's going to be overcome, well then what we really need are forms of culture and forms of political imagination which are capable of thinking, of thinking of, of expressing some democratic desires in ways which are unlimited, either unlimited by those kind of, um, you know, reactionary limitations, but also um, of but also are you know, sort of committed to the potentiation of collectivities, the potentiation of, um, <coughs> you know, of potent and complex collectivities. I'm not as uh, I'm not as sort of a pessimist. I think I'm not as pessimistic as some people about you know the the, potent, you know, the scope for doing that kind of thing in the early 21st century. So I think we're in a very interesting moment, which is in the evolution of capital whereby the leading edge of capitalism is, is clearly shifting to um, you know, what, we, what some commentators are calling platform capitalism, what we might call or a form of capitalism which is organised almost in, you know, at, at its leading edge around the, exist, around the deployment of platform and digital uh, communications technologies. And I think one thing that's quite clear from that process is that although, um, although there are all kinds of um, political and social costs to the ways in which those uh, technologies are being deployed, especially insofar as they're deployed by monopoly capitalists operating at a global scale. I think they also, it's also um, clear that in this phase of capitalism, as in fact I would say in all previous phases of capitalism, um, capital does need to create conditions in which people are capable of being genuinely open in, and creative in a collective way in order to um, be able to sort of exploit and um, commodify the outputs of that collective creativity. So I think this is, um, I think, I think, I think this is true even in the Industrial Revolution, but, and it's certainly true today, and I think it's one of the paradoxes of our current situation, that on the one hand, as I think we're all aware, we're in a world in which Google and Facebook um, and these great, you know, the great giants of contemporary capitalism are busily, you know, act, you know, are busily sort of monitoring and extracting as much data, as much behavioural surplus, as they call it, from our interactions. But they're only, but to a certain extent, they're only able to do that by creating large zones of actual social engagement, which do make certain kinds of creativity possible, do make certain kinds of sociality possible. And I think, you know, for example, the sort of movement, those, those masses of people who we see campaigning and chiefing, in that, in that picture that I showed, have only been enabled by things like Facebook groups, WhatsApp groups, sort of digital, um, digital technologies of that kind. I think the question then in, in, um, you know, in, in the context of a gallery, in the context of a project like this one, is well, what, you know, what would we want from, what types of cultural practice, what further types of political practice might facilitate the emergence, the crystallization, of genuinely potent collectivities like this under these circumstances. And I think this is why the concept of solidarity, which doesn't get, I mean, it doesn't, uh, uh, for all I know, there's a huge literature on solidarity in Germany, which everybody here knows, and I don't know anything about, so maybe there is. But certainly in this sort of Anglo French world of critical theory, no, it's not, a, it's, not a, it's not a term, it's not something people really talk about very much. Um, it's not something that really gets conceptualised. And I would say that as I, what I would propose is that an ideal of solidarity, um, as understood in, you know, understood in quite a specific way, 
um, is something in which we should be looking for. It's something which um, contemporary for various contemporary and historical types of aesthetic practice and political practice have a real capacity to generate and produce. And I'll sort of make just a few remarks to finish on what, you know, what, what are the actual features of solidarity as an experience, as a mode of being, as a mode of sociality, which, um, you know, which can be, you know, which can be usefully, usefully extracted from these historical examples. But I would say solidarity, I mean, the term in English, I mean, it comes from the French term, actually. It comes from the French term, sorry, solidaire, and initially what it, what it implies, what it means, refers to, actually, is an idea of shared risk. It's the idea, it refers to an idea that the risks and dangers posed by participants in some endeavour are shared, are kind of common with each other. And I think this is important because I think an idea of solidarity, the idea of solidarity speaks to an, an idea of shared interests uh, and, and also to the possibility of a shared future. Now this sounds, I think this sounds very banal, but I think it's actually very important because certainly both in, within, within um, sort of radical politics and within a lot of sort of supposedly radical theory over the past few decades, the notion of interests as, as an organising term for thinking about politics or thinking about even sort of social and cultural experience has really sort of been displaced, it's been sort of denigrated and it's been often replaced with notions of identity, the idea that actually what organises people politically, what enables people to, to come together are is the sharing of identities. And I would, I would say actually, well of course identity and processes of identification are very important, but even, for example, in some of the examples I've alluded to, you can see that some of the most powerful moments of political radicalisation, democratic mobilisation, have been precisely moments where some sense of a shared interest and a shared possibility of the future becoming really exceeds any notion of identitarian categories. I think it's also interesting to reflect that the, um, I think, you know, some of the most important sort of cultural forms, I think, of the, of the past few decades, can be understood as forms whose potency has really derived from their capacity to facilitate, to enable experiences of solidarity. And um, so one of the things I've really sort of, one of the things I've sort of been writing about, I've been involved with as a practitioner for really for decades now, has been sort of the, you know, the sort of dance culture tradition, which really has its roots in sort of you know, a certain strand of underground culture in New York in the 1970s which is you know, historically sort of characterised by, um, by a certain utopian kind of cosmopolitan, you know, a sort of utopian cosmopolitanism. This is a sort of disco and house tradition. Um, this is a picture of the loft, you know, the party, the sort of New York party, which is still, is still seen as the sort of, you know, the central or the kind of foundational institution of that whole tradition. But, you know, so, um, and I think it's interesting to reflect that while you know, the, the relationship, for example, of sort of white listeners to black music has often given rise to a lot of sort of anxiety and a lot of, um, you know, fretting over issues like cultural appropriation, issues like, you know, um, and different ways of conceptualising sort of positive affects which people experience, you know, on a dance floor, for example, have been thought of in terms of escape, have been thought of in terms of um, deterritorialisation. One way in which we can think about the kind of the kind of affective properties which that kind of you know, culture tries to cultivate is in terms of a certain experience of solidarity. And I think certainly I would say, so in my own experience, actually, that's when the cultural forms like that, I'm going to take that um, when cultural forms like that um, are able to kind of achieve some kind of social or political efficacy, that's really their function. Their function is to cultivate relations of solidarity and experiences of solidarity between the participants. I think also it's an interesting way of thinking, it's also an interesting way of thinking about um, you might want to plug in the bit now. Alright, thanks. I think it's also there's a very blurry picture <coughs> from a yeah, London party. I think um, it's also um, but I think it's also an interesting way to think about what some kind of current projects um, around um, 
related, you know, coming mostly out of the sort of art scene, uh, informed by ideas like the Commons, um, have been trying to do. So a project I've been a little bit involved with, just in kind of writing and theoretical capacity, uh, over the past uh, year is the Creating Commons project, curated by Felix Stalder and um, Cornelius Holfrank, which is really curating a whole range, a range of different sort of projects, all of which are in some ways trying to cultivate um, social relations of sociality and a productive relationality in particular contexts. And one of the ones, which is one of the, the projects there, which is local to me actually, is, um, I don't know, that's completely the wrong slide, um, is the Furtherfield project. Furtherfield is a project uh, based in North London and they're an art group, uh, which they have a gallery in Finsbury Park, which is a, a very well-known, highly frequented park in North London. And a lot of their work is about involving members of the local community and trying to come together to imagine new futures for public space, to imagine new ways of being and inhabiting, um, inhabiting uh, the urban environment in the 21st century and beyond. And I think, but again, I think a very interesting way of thinking about what they're trying to cultivate there. They, the, the language they use is a language of relationality, which really goes back to the relational art idea of so 20 years ago, and the language of the commons. But um, I think one way of understanding what they're trying to do with a lot of these projects is actually to cultivate relations of solidarity, to meaningful solidarity between members of the community, the local community, by getting them to come together, getting them to, uh, getting them to sort of share ideas, getting them to think about their shared interests and experiences. And I think, I think in all of these ways, then, I think, um, I think an ideal of solidarity, and I think the idea of a, sort of a step of a, of a solidarity is of an, as something which might inform um, sort of aesthetic projects as well as political ones, it's a potentially very productive one. If what we're trying to do is, is to imagine and to reconstitute forms of democracy uh, you know, beyond the sort of limitations imposed upon it by uh, decades of neoliberal hegemony. I'll leave it there.